And welcome back to coverage here for round number six of the MPL and Rivals Gauntlets. Marshall Sutcliffe with Cedric Phillips. And we are underway between two countrymen here. Shoti Asoka versus Shintaro Ishimura. Interesting that uh, they chose very different decks for the tournament, Cedric. And also, if you uh, turn your attention to their webcams, you'll see they have very different personal styles when it comes to expressing themselves. Shota won't give you really anything under any circumstance. He won the Pro Tour and started sleeving up his decks <laughs> into the box. He put it, he just simply started putting his cards away after he won. But uh, Shintaro's much more animated, as you'll see, uh, I'm sure, in this match. Uh, indeed he is. And so it is a fun, uh, fun difference to watch between the two players and how they react or don't react over the course of a game. Other surprise here for me too, Marshall, is the deck selection here for both players. Uh, Ishimaru has a pretty wide range. Uh, and while I think Demir Rogues is in the range, and obviously mm -hmm. we're seeing that play out this way, when I think of Shota, I do not think of Naya and Creatures basically ever. So I was a little bit surprised by this deck selection, especially when Izzy Control is one of the more played decks here uh, this particular weekend. And it appears to be, at least for Reed Duke, a pretty good one. So um, I was a little bit surprised at the deck selection Same. for Shota. But, you know, things are going well enough thus far. 3-2 isn't the best or the worst record. Uh, it's kind of middle of the road, which is a pretty obvious statement. But things are going well enough, I'd say. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, he really does shy away from decks like this traditionally. He likes to play... Control decks primarily, instant speed stuff he's into. Um, he likes to react to you. And this is kind of the opposite of all those things. This is a proactive deck that generally is trying to be the one on the front foot. Uh, it wins on the, you know, with creatures dealing damage to the opponent. That isn't something that he's normally into either. So I am curious to see how Shota reacts here, uh, you know, and plays this deck. I mean, I assume he'll play it excellently. He, he generally tends to do so, but uh, it is a departure from his normal style, no doubt about it. It is also kind of interesting here, this addition of Vantress Gargoyle. If I think about the history of Rogues and when it really kind of hit the ground running, I remember Seth Manfield bringing that deck out of nowhere to one of the events and had some copies of Vantress Gargoyle. Now, eventually, as we all know, over time, you know, there was the battle of, do you play Ruin Crab, do you not play Ruin Crab? Some are in favor, some are not. Deckless, do you play Luris, do you not play Luris? And things evolved over time, as all great decks do. But I remember initial versions of this deck did have Vantress Gargoyle, and so in a weird way, we're kind of coming full circle back to the 5-4. That's right. People, you know, going back to the archives here in the late, late, late stages of this standard format and picking out some real spicy ones here. This Vantress Gargoyle is definitely on that list. As you can see, it's the huge 5-4 flyer for just the two mana, but it comes with a little bit of a restriction on it as well. Yeah. But uh, but still, you know, it's doing work here. And and before you know it, these Soaring Thought Thieves are going to be rumbling. Now, one thing that Vantress Gargoyle dies to that Rune Crab does not is Chop Down. That's and true. see that here. So chop down actually needing to be played to get that thing kind of out of the way in order to open up the gates for Goldspan Dragon and friends. So mm -hmm. you know could could be seen as a positive, could be seen as a negative. I mean, having to use removal spell takes some time there for for Shota. So just a thing to kind of recognize is, well, it looks like we're going to see some flyers maybe get a little busy here for Ishimura. He certainly is incentivized to want to to get those last few cards into the graveyard here for Shota. All the little things add up here. It's kind of funny. The chop down for Shota, of course, doesn't actually put a card into the graveyard. As Giant Killer's off on an adventure at the moment. Maybe. Mm. No, no. Maybe no attacks. Stay home. Okay. That is a rarity. But that is what we see here. Luris is going to get put into hand here. Then a land drop and go for Ishimura. You can see he's got Crippling Fear in hand to go with his Luris as well as a land. And that's just going to keep everything right where it's at. An island off the top of the library now for Shintaro. For those of you who play a lot of Magic Online, Shintaro is Riser, if you've ever bumped into him in the queues. Lost to him plenty. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I was going to say, first things first, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
you got unlucky for getting paired up against one of the preeminent Magic Online grinders. Yeah, the old, the old, uh, the old bad pairing, as it were. Indeed. <laughs> there's that. There's, ja- there's I, that. There's I once Jabberwocky. again got unlucky and yeah. got paired against a player who's better than me. <laughs> yeah. That's just how it breaks sometimes. Why does this keep happening? <laughs> All right, but that is a, a nicely timed uh, Vantress Gargoyle here. As Shintaro does what you do with Luris, which is make sure you get something out of it because Luris is about the biggest target you can put on the battlefield for removal. You should never assume that it's going to survive anything more than a phase change, you know? And, uh, and that's why you see players save up their mana like we did Shintaro here as he gets a Vantress Gargoyle back down. That's also going to clear the way here for the dragon. Yep. Gold spans in the house. All right, another Vantress Gargoyle. Okay. Let's shut her down. Yeah, it gets a little awkward here, uh, especially the second Vantress Gargoyle. You know, in order for Shintaro to be able to start blocking, he needs to have four cards in his hand. And this game is really starting to come down to him needing to find it into the story stat. End of the story, yes, but also I think kind of the plan here is to get the maximum that you can from Crippling Fear, uh, and that's not working out great right now. Not at all. Not at all. You can see how the Gargoyle slots in nicely to that game plan, though. You can name Rogues, and the Crippling Fear still won't actually take out the Gargoyles. But two Four Toughness creatures, in fact, lethal. And that's going to be it. That's key. A lot of lands there for Shintari Shimura, and Double Dragon gets the job done there for Shoti Asoka in game number one as players move to sideboarding. Let's see what they're taking in and out here. It looks like Shintaro is going to cut the Wind Robbers and bring in removal slash counter spells, and it's pretty significant sideboarding there for Shota. Yeah, this is a pretty big change. We're seeing, what, two, three, four, five. That's seven cards in. Seven cards out. Cleaves are going to leave. Looks like those Goldspan Dragons that just won the game are going to go away. And that's also worth noting, right? Because you would think, oh, a Goldspan Dragon just won you the game. You drew two of them. And you cleaned up your opponent pretty quickly. It's like, well, things change after sideboard. Just right. because something worked in one particular game doesn't mean that's how Shota thinks that things are going to play out in future games. So those Goldspan Dragons will bite the dust. A Giant Killer, which was useful against Rancher Scargoyle, and then tapping down things, you know, that's also going to leave, and then a Chariot as well. So some significant cyborg here with Soka. Yeah, the the one that stands out to me the most, Cedric, is, is Ox of Agonis coming in. He's got two of those coming in. Well, those escape cards continue to be huge against this type of strategy. Always have been, always will be. Some of them are better than others, and I, you could argue that Ox of Agonis is the best of the bunch, that right. if you expect rogues to be very popular as a metagame choice in a standard tournament. Ox of Agonis, assuming you have red mana, of course, is one of the best ways to go about taking advantage of the fact that they are milling you so much. Yeah, you know, it's the combination of taking away so many cards out of your graveyard to basically shut down the bonuses that the rogues player gets from, you know, having all those cards in your yard, but also only costing two mana at the same time, and then... It's just a super powerful spell on top of all that. It means I agree with you. It's it's the number one option if you have access to it. Here's Magda on the stack. Thieves Guild Enforcer is going to get played in response. Turn is going to get passed over. And it looks like mana efficiency is the name of the game here for Shintaro. As he's just going to go ahead and put Luris into hand after playing a land and pass the turn back. He's going to leave back the, Th- the Thieves Guild Enforcer on defense, perhaps willing to trade it off with the uh, Magda, and that's what's going to happen here. Yeah, Magda's still generating a little bit of value by leaving a treasure behind for the showdown of the Skulls that could be coming here in a turn or two. So trading your Magda with the Field Enforcer doesn't ever really feel great, but you are still left with a resource that is, especially in this game, quite relevant. Clothis God of Destiny hits the battlefield, though, for Shota with the shields down here for Shintaro. He's going to need to get something moving pretty quickly here. He has Luris in hand but decides not to play it as he's got a little bit of an awkward situation here with his mana. He has access to up to two black mana this turn, but he'd need a third if he was going to be able to get back 
the Thieves Guild Enforcer. And unfortunately for Shintaro, that one turn window when he doesn't get it back means that Clothis gets to eat it for lunch. Yeah, really, really bad news. I mean, I got to say, even though the, the, the games have been kind of short and unwieldy, I mean, these crippling fears have been like an F minus. Yeah. I mean, there are situations where they're an A plus, but thus far they have been quite bad here for Ishimura. Wow, and look at this. We talked about it last game, but Ishimura is forced to just run out of Luris with nothing in the yard at all to get back. It's just three two lifelink, your move. I mean, gotta get something going. Have you seen? Yeah, <laughs> these crippling fears, these ah, can they yeah, do something, I, please? Thus far, yeah, the answer is not at all. Zero. Now, is there an answer for it here from Yes, there is. Shot's just gonna use a shatter skull smashing to take it out. He even has an innkeeper to follow up before passing turn. There's a little bit of action. Storing Thought Thief off the top of the library. And the awkwardness continues with the mana here for Shintaro. You know, he still only has two black sources of mana. Perhaps he'd like to use Crippling Fear, even just to take down an innkeeper, but he'd prefer to get the Soaring Thought Thief down, and he's going to leave that up plus drown in the lock here. This game is your friendly reminder that I think all Magic players, and they're playing a deck, they kind of have a thing in their head about how the game's going to play, right? Like Demir Rogues, all right, I'm going to start off with a Thief Field Enforcer, that will play a Soaring Thought Thief, then my opponent will have enough cards in the graveyard that my creatures get larger, then I resolve it into the story. You know, if you're nigh adventures, I'm going to have an Edgewell Innkeeper and then Bone Crusher Giant and all this other stuff. And uh, the reality of the situation is games do not always go according to plan because what we're watching right now is just a mess of a game. That's right. And you actually see awkwardness for Shota here as well. He's going to cast Ox of Agonis, but he does have two spells in hand and he's going to ditch those here. Looks like they weren't high priority for him, though. They have been replaced by two lands. And a love struck beast, but with the edge wall innkeeper out there, that still might just be good enough. There's disdainful stroke. Wow, the answers for Shintaro have just been miserable in the way that they've lined up. I guess he finally has a window here for this crippling fear. No, it, I'm wrong. He like, passed. I guess. Turn I guess so. Uh, yeah, I I was thinking the same thing. It might not be a bad time to cast it, but you do have stroke plus drown plus heartless act up. So yeah, I, I think maybe if you're Shintaro, like you might be thinking, okay, my best draw is a swamp or like a black source of mana, so I can play crippling fear and then have a drown the lock, right? Like so I can double spell my opponent with fear plus something else, right? Now that's not coming to fruition just yet, but it might be in the future as it looks like love struck beast is now going to come online. It does, and of course it replaces itself because of the edge wall innkeeper on the battlefield. And don't forget, Ox of Agona slams pretty good. It's hitting for four here. Shatara's going to take it. He's down to 12. Yeah, maybe now is the time. Well, and, and wow, we're just out of here? All right, we're just okay. Wow, Shantara wasn't having any of it. He found yeah. another island off the top of the library, and he scooped them up. Wow. That, I was surprised by that. It looked Oof. like there was still some magic to be played, but apparently not. Shota Yasuoka picks up the match in two quick games.